All right, so we're going to talk about the kind of just fundamentals of weather and then get into how those kind of relate to the things that the FAA kind of wants you to look out for and know. All right, so all weather is created by unequal heating of the Earth's surface. So you basically just have the equator, and this isn't a, a perfect representation because the Earth is tilted on an axis, but uh, actually this way looks like. Anyways, um, but it's good enough. And so you can see the equator right here, this distance is closer to the surface of the sun than the up at the poles, north and southern latitudes, these distances are longer. So simply because the equator is closer, you get more heating in these regions. And then it's colder, you know, up in the near the poles, the polar, you know, the polar Arctic region, stuff like that. Okay. So that's sort of the basics. And uh, you'll see why this matters. This is kind of the key concept to all sort of the start of all weather patterns. Um, so as I mentioned, this creates different temperature zones uh, between the different latitudes of Earth. So we have like the Tropic of Capricorn down here, Tropic of Cancer. So that's a, a line of latitude, basically. And, you know, in here you get, we have this one is a tropical zone. This is a tropical zone. So the ones near the equators. Then you have these like temperate zones, right? That are kind of like, you know, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You can kind of think of it as the one that's just right, you know, not too hot, not too cold. And then you got the Arctic zones, which we we pointed out. And again, it's because of the dif distance the sun has to travel and the kind of angle at which it hits. You know, the sun here hit, it's hitting the earth straight on. And so it's going to heat it up the most. And then the earth is spinning you know, around like that. So this all gets heated here in the middle the most, all right? And then you can see the earth is kind of tilted on its axis. Um, we don't need to get into this. You don't, the FAA doesn't ask you about this or anything, but this is why we have seasons uh, is because this axis also kind of spins around as we orbit the sun. And so different parts of the um, earth are pointed closer to the sun or further away from the sun. And so that's kind of where seasons come from. But anyways, I'm not going to get, in, I don't want to get bogged down on, uh, details on that. All right. So this starts to create what's known as sort of circulation patterns. And we have a 3d kind of con conceptualization of this as if you were to, you know, look, you know, through our atmosphere, this is our, you know, our atmosphere up here. And you were to take a a uh, slice through it and, and kind of see what's going on. So I'm going to try to explain these the best I can to you guys and understand how, you know, the heating from the sun relates to these. So as I mentioned, right, the sun heats this part and then it's cooler up here, right? So cold weather has higher pressure because, and this is in, in terms of weather now, well, this is a really confusing topic for a lot of student pilots because when you talk about like the altimeter, temperature usually goes goes with pressure. And that's, so that's a totally kind of different concept. And it's because of the systems in which they're in. And, you know, the altimeter is pretty much kind of like a closed system and it works differently than the open atmosphere. So that's just one thing I wanted to note that this is different than if you were thinking of an altimeter where you, you're flying through the air and your altimeter feels warm air. It's also gonna feel as if it's higher pressure. So that temperature goes with pressure in term, when you're thinking of the altimeter, but in terms of the earth and the atmosphere, they are opposite. So we have cold temperature and that creates a uh, higher density, okay? So the atoms are more tightly packed together and they don't move around as much. So there's colder temperatures, but they're higher packed, higher density. Warm air is less dense and it's able to rise, because it's less dense, it's able to rise and expand and it has less pressure. So a way to conceptualize this is imagine that these are all blocks, okay? And they all have a weight, okay? The blue one blue block, one blue block, oops. 
So blue, one blue block is equal in mass to one red block. Okay. So if the blue block is much, you know, it's much more compact, it has the same amount of mass in a smaller amount of space, right? You can stack up in the same um, amount of volume, right? The same amount of height here in this 2D representation of this. One, two, three, four, five, six blue blocks. And if those weigh, you know, one pound, that's six pounds of, of blue blocks, right? And then, but in the same amount of volume, we can only stack three red blocks because they're less dense for the mass. So they weigh the same amount of mass, um, right? One blue block equals one red block, but you can't fit them into the same amount of volume because they're less dense. They take up more space. So this is only three pounds. So now think of this blue block as cold temperatures up here in the poles. Okay, they're gonna sink down and really condense and because they're dense, right? They're gonna sink down and create this really dense block. And so this block down here at the bottom, right? Has five pounds of pressure on top of it. Okay, now this red block here has only two pounds of pressure on top of it. So that's really what pressure is, is measuring the mass of a column of air above something. Okay, so in this cold temperature example, right, this bottom block has five pounds of pressure on top of it, while in the warm, because it expands and kind of rises up in the same amount of volume, this column of air only has two pounds of pressure on top of it. Okay, so that's just kind of a visual representation of what I mean by cold air being more dense, it sinks down, and you have higher pressure because of it, because there's more weight in that column of air. Right. Okay. So up here in this cold, we have air sinking. Okay. So the air sinks here. And then the other thing, because it is higher pressure, higher pressure always wants to go to areas of low pressure. It's like the, you know, the, the least path of least resistance. Okay. So it's going to travel down here to where the pressure is lower, where there's um, high temperatures, right? But eventually, as it gets further co close to the equator, it starts to warm up and it starts to rise again. Okay. And that's how you kind of create this little circulation pattern up in the poles. Now, the same thing, but kind of opposite happens in the equator. You have, again, low density air because of the heat causes air to rise. And then because the air rise, it creates a void here. And we have the high, higher density, colder air fill that void. Okay, and then this air starts circulating here, it starts cooling down, and then it sinks. And so we get kind of like an opposite circulation pattern here near the equator. And then here in the temperate zones, uh, it's a little bit different. The way I like to think of it, it's, it's reacting based off the cold air up here, cold circulation up here, and that's also reacting off the red uh, warm circulation down here. And so I like to think of, you know, the, this air is sinking here and it's like a vacuum pulling air down. So this air is going to come down here in the temperate zone because it's it's getting sucked in by the by this circulation pattern here. Right. Oops, sorry, that was a bad arrow. And then up here, you have a vacuum kind of sucking the air upwards from this cold air circulation. So you get that. And then so it ends up just kind of circulating, filling the void here, left down here, and then circulating around like that. So that's my explanation of the circulation patterns. But OK, why does that matter to us as pilots? Well, that's kind of like the 3D view and how it explains how, you know, the heating from the sun, you know, heating the equator more uh, causes um, the, the general circulation patterns. But what we we more so care about, especially when you get into you know larger jet planes, you start you know uh, thinking about easterly, westerly, and trade winds at a, at a more global scale when you're flying long distances. So, what do these circulation patterns look like for surface winds? And when we talk about that, we have to think of something called the Coriolis effect. Okay. 
So the Earth spins this way, and the rotational velocity of the Earth is much higher here at the equator. So if this arrow represents, the length of this arrow represents the rotational velocity, because it's wider at the center, it has to have a higher rotational velocity to get around one turn in the same amount of time that this has up here, that the circle has up here. And I don't want to go too much into detail on the core asphalt force. We have a video on it on our YouTube. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on that. But essentially, it's going to cause all the winds to be basically shifted. In, and we're talking about the northern hemisphere shifted in this direction. If you can see, they all kind of align with these lines here, okay? So let's draw out these, uh, these circulation patterns on here. So if, let's do the poles, the temperate zones, and then we have the, the tropical zones. So if we draw out just this, this line right here, right, coming down, Okay, we draw that in just 2D. It comes down, but then the Coriolis effect shifts it this way. Okay, because of the, the spinning of the earth, right? So then we're ended up with just like the line that's drawn. So the easterlies, it goes from east to west. So that's how you get easterlies. So the general direction of the large, you know, jets, uh, winds and stuff are easterly. Okay, now here, uh, and I kind of drew these sections bad, but we're on this, this uh, section right here. It's going up to the north, right? So if we draw that in 2D, straight would just be like that. But then again, because of Coriolis force, if we shift it that way, it's going to look like these. And it's going to generally go from west to east. And that's where we get the westerlies. Okay, so that matches these kind of arrows right here, right? And then finally, uh, by the equator, again, we have the wind coming down, filling in, you know, the rising air near the equator, closest to the equator, it rises because it's hot, and then cold air fills in. So we get air coming down towards the equator. And then again, we shift it in this direction because of the spinning of the earth, the Coriolis effect. And so we get these, and these are called the trade winds. And they're called the trade winds because back when you started trading from, you know, Europe and Africa in ships, they would ride these winds right here near the equator. Sorry, I drew them in the temperate zone, but in the equator and you could travel to, you know, the Americas. So that's why they called them the trade winds when they would trade things, right? And then everything is going to be flipped in the southern hemisphere, right? So you, you can see that here. It's just like a mirror image if you were to flip it. Okay, so that's kind of, I'm gonna stop here and just check the, the comments, see if anybody has any comments. Um, it may take you a few times listening to this to really understand this. It's a few concepts and it, it does take a little bit more time than we have to, to really narrow it down. But again, I'm trying to give you guys just the fundamental principles um, so you don't get too bogged down. And, I, and when I say that, I also wanna add if you are feeling overwhelmed by the concept of weather and you're digging down and you're saying, well, you know, well, why do these winds go this way? And why did it um, try and just at first as a student pilot, try and just focus on the things in weather that affect you as a pilot. And then once you kind of understand that, then you can add on more because if you just look at try and figure out everything and you know, maybe, um, who was it? Uh, Nate, uh, Dr. Parker, who's on, who works for a weather company, maybe he can uh, uh, um, agree with this, that, you know, it's an endless amount of, of stuff to look into climate and weather. Uh, so as a student pilot, you don't want to get too bogged down into to everything. Obviously, you want to understand the fundamental details. But if I, at first, my recommendation, if you're feeling overwhelmed, just try to, to memorize and understand the things that affect pilots. And we're going to get to that here next. All right. So now I want to talk about high pressure systems and low pressure systems. So we talked about 
um, low pressure systems, right, have hot air that rises. Okay, so it rises. Let's go back up to here, right? So this hot air here at the equators rises, and then it has air from around, you know, colder air from around it fill in the space, right? Because it leaves a void. Okay, so low pressure. Um, in low pressure systems, you have air coming in. So that's what these red arrows are, right? You have warm air here in the center, it rises, and you have air from around it filling in, okay? So you get these kind of uh, wind patterns around a low pressure system, okay, at first. And this is before we take into effect the Coriolis effect. For high pressure, you have air sinking here in the center, air sinks down, right? Because it's more dense. And then it has to go somewhere eventually, so it escapes outward. So it goes down and then goes outward to areas of low pressure that surround it, okay? Because pressure likes to go from high to low. So now when we incorporate again, that Coriolis force that maybe remember tilted everything this way, we can redraw these but tilted to the right for the Coriolis effect. Okay, now that's a lot of, um, let me here, let me redraw this so it's not as confusing. So if every line kind of redirects to the right because of the Coriolis effect, this is what you get. And if you look here in the center, Everything is kind of spinning in this direction, which is counterclockwise. So in the Northern Hemisphere, low pressure systems, that's why they circulate counterclockwise. So air rises and rotates counterclockwise. Now here in the Southern Hemisphere, it would be the opposite because remember, everything is from the Coriolis effect is that way, but in, in the Northern Hemisphere, but in the Southern Hemisphere, it's mirrored. So it'll be the opposite in the Southern Hemisphere. But most of the people on here right now are flying in the Northern Hemisphere. So that's the important one to remember. And then you can just remember Southern Hemisphere is opposite. Now, same thing here. If we draw these as being um, redirected to the right, um, let's see here. Always confuses me here redirected to the right. So let me erase this. Or here, I'll do it right next to it, actually. Re -re redirect to the right. Again, because of the Coriolis effect, you see everything is spinning clockwise here for high pressure systems. So again, it's the combination of high pressure systems sinking and then going outwards to the lower pressure around it and the Coriolis effect that gives you this kind of shape for high pressure systems, the sinking and clockwise rotation in the Northern Hemisphere. And then for low pressure systems, the air rises and air comes in to fill the void and then the Coriolis effect turns it to the right. So you get rising air and counterclockwise rotation here in a low pressure system.